It's time for Breaking Bread with Papa. Hey! Don't you know? Hey! It's our goal. Hey! It's time for Breaking Bread with Papa. Hey! Don't you know? Hey! It's also a show. Hey! Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Breaking Bread with Tom Papa. I am Tom Papa. Thank you for spending some time with us. I hope you're enjoying your summer. I hope you're eating a lot of good things. I hope that uh, you've, you've decided that it's no longer a battle that's going to be won, that you are going to look exactly as you look in that bathing suit, and there's no changing it. So, yes, give me a hot dog with some sauerkraut and some mustard. Yes, give me another burger. Yes, give me some pie. Just let me enjoy my life. <laughs> and I'll go run on the beach or do pickleball and tell myself I'm working out, but just I hope you're enjoying yourself and having a good time and keeping safe out there. We've got a great show for you today. We have Sam Anderson on the program. Sam Anderson. He has an amazing podcast called Crooked City Emerald Triangle. It's the second installment of Crooked City, and Emerald Triangle is his amazing, amazing story when he went up to weed country in Northern California investigating a murder on a pot farm that came to his attention because one of the people involved he actually went to high school with. He had this interest in those farms and what was going on up there. He's got a great journalistic mind, Sam, and I know because he is my nephew, and he's Super smart, super smart, super curious, great writer. And he had this great idea and started investigating what was what that culture is. This was right before it was all legal. And then a story breaks that his someone that he went to school with was involved in a murder up at one of these pot farms where where a bunch of the workers were accused of killing the guy running the farm and it just went off from there and I watched him as he put together this story for I guess three years maybe four years and he was just diligent and he just was fearless and got these amazing interviews and put it into this great podcast Emerald City and uh, Emerald Triangle sorry Emerald Triangle Crooked City Emerald Triangle and it's great It's really a good listen, and he's going to be cranking out a lot more stuff. He's already working on other ideas, and uh, I was very excited that he was coming through town with my daughter's graduation, and I was able to get him on the podcast because I really, really want to give him as much uh, a chance to spread the word about this podcast. It is legit. You are going to like it, and after this conversation, if your interest isn't peaked, then you probably fell asleep or you were at the dog park listening to this and kept hitting fast forward and it, it, and it, it maybe you dropped it in a, in a puddle. <laughs> it's too good. It's really good. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Today's podcast is brought to you by TomPapa.com. Oh, what do you get there? You get my book. We're all in this together, so make some room. Uh, thank you all for buying it. Thank you all for purchasing it on an audio book or Amazon. Make sure you go back and review it and uh, leave stars, as many stars as they'll let you. That would be my advice. Uh, It helps spread the word. It helps feed the algorithm and keep the the, uh, momentum going for the book. Also at TomPapa.com, all of my tour dates. Uh, Next week, yeah, I think, well, but then this comes out the 16th, July 16th. I will be in Delaware doing an amazing show at the Pavilion Arts Center and it's an outdoor venue. It's a beautiful spot. It's going to be a great time. Then we're also going up to New Hampshire this summer. We're going to Anaheim. We're going out to West Hampton. We're going up to Montreal Comedy Festival, and we've got a lot of fun stuff, and then the fall tour is packed. NJ Pack, huge show at NJ Pack on October 21st. It's the biggest venue I've ever played in my home state. Very excited for that one. Also, we've got St. Louis. We've got, yeah, where else? We're going to uh, Charleston, South Carolina. 
We're going to Nashville. We're going to Vegas. So many spots. A ton of spots. Now, I wonder, can I talk about this yet? I don't think so. I may or may not have a show at The Wynn coming up in Las Vegas. I don't know, so keep it quiet. Unless you can buy tickets and you go on the website, then you can tell everybody. But uh, I'll be announcing that officially <laughs> shortly. But right now, uh, enjoy my conversation with Sam Anderson. Do you wear headphones or no? Uh, we don't wear headphones because they don't make them small enough for the dinosaur. Uh, I see. Are you scared that the dinosaur is biting your face? Uh, not yet. Is it biting my face? It literally <laughs> is biting your face. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Sammy. Thanks, Tom. This is very exciting. I didn't know whether or not to uh, even give you bread because every mm. guest gets bread, but your family and uh, I've had a lot of your bread. You've had a lot I've of my bread, lot and of you're bread. gonna get bread tonight, <laughs> and you're gonna leave tomorrow and leave with gonna, more bread. Yeah, you have a loaf for us to take on the road. I do. Oh, that's amazing. But I, th this is this is. Uh, I brought you this bread. Oh, what do we have here? You're gonna be very excited. This is a, uh, oh, a jalapeno and cheddar. Oh, right. Nice. Come on now. That is a nice loaf. Yeah. You've really, you know, it's gotten better and better. I've got to say. Yeah. Over the years, this is a good looking. Yeah, I appreciate that. I have another loaf at home, so you, we can you can actually just take this with you on your trip. But uh, that one's already cut. And I went for my physical yesterday. And uh, he's like, you could lose a little weight. <laughs> and uh, your blood pressure is borderline. Dial it in and you won't have to go on any meds. You're, you're good. And I was like, all right, cool. And then I came home and baked this <laughs> two giant <laughs> loaves of jalapeno and cheddar. And just started. Wah, 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 wah. I'm like, I don't care. I'll take the meds. <laughs> Do you ever get tired of eating it? No. Getting tired of bread is like getting tired of sun. Or water. Yeah, it's like there's no getting. Yeah. When I, w in the morning, before my radio show, and I'm like, I just got to, something with the coffee, I don't need a giant breakfast, but one little piece of toast with butter of homemade bread. It's kind of all you need. You're, I'm good. Mm -hmm. I really don't have to eat until, I tell myself I don't have to eat until dinner, and then I'm so hungry by dinner, then I start making martinis and stuffing everything <laughs> in my face that I possibly can. <laughs> I remember when I was in, like, middle school, we had to read an autobiography uh -huh. of Ben Franklin, mm -hmm. and he talks about going to Philadelphia as, like, a young boy. Yeah. He's, like, a little... He's, like, a kid <laughs> yeah. alone in this city, and... Like, eight years old, he, And he, all he had with him was just, like... He, literally nothing. I don't think he brought anything with him. <laughs> and uh, he was like, well, I decided to go in search of a bakery because I've made many a meal out of a loaf of bread. Yes. And he goes and he finds himself a loaf of bread. And so if it's good enough for Ben Franklin, it's good <laughs> it's enough for best. us. That literally is the best. When I was in Paris, my first time ever in Paris, and my sister, your mother, told me that she would just get like a little thing of cheese and a baguette, and mm -hmm. that was... Because she had no money when she was traveling as a kid. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that sounds so good. Mm -hmm. But then I would, I have money, so I would go to big restaurants and then eat a baguette with cheese like, <laughs> on my way to the restaurant. You know what's funny? <laughs> that's why my blood pressure is almost <laughs> ah! Just a little bit. It's funny because in, in New Jersey, where we're from, you sit down at the restaurant and they always give you a basket of bread. Yeah. No, almost doesn't even have to be an Italian restaurant, mostly yeah. Italian, but almost anywhere you go, you would get a little bit of bread. Yeah. And when I moved to California, I noticed that that's just not really a thing. It's not really a thing. And they ask, mm -hmm. would you like bread? Because they get yelled at by people who just bring bread because there's, there's a lot of people trying to be skinny or gluten or whatever. They're insulted. You would even think they would eat bread. Exactly. Wow. The other side of it, one of my favorite Italian restaurants in uh, this area, I won't mention them because I'm going to slam them for a second, <laughs> uh, because of pandemic times and inflationary times, mm -hmm. they do this thing on the menu where they, they'll charge you for the bread, $1.50 per person. That's unacceptable. I would rather you just bury the bread. Just add a dollar <laughs> to everything I'm going to order. And don't tell me that's what's up. Just call it a pandemic service charge. Yes. Don't. 
There's don't tell me I'm so low yeah, it's rent a, about it's it. It's very upsetting. It's very upsetting. <laughs> You're supposed to welcome them as family and hey, and here's yeah. a, and some olive oil, dollar fifty per person, yeah. and it's not cheap. It's not. But then that's how like, is the bread though? It's it, pretty good. It's pretty good. It is pretty good. Mm-hmm. It's not like this. this. Yeah. But, you know, this doesn't belong in an Italian restaurant. No. This belongs in your face. Well, Sam, the reason that we uh, have you here, I'll do a proper intro um, when you're not here so as not to embarrass you. <laughs> uh, first of all is your podcast, which is your was your passion project that you put together. Uh, for years, you yeah. were talking about it. <laughs> and uh, Crooked City... Uh, Emerald Triangle, and which is amazing, and we're going to talk about. But then also, good for us here at Breaking Bread, mm-hmm. you also now have a new project where you is, do we call it a blog? Do I'm calling call it, a it a blog. I'm calling it a blog. You're calling it a blog. It's more of a newsletter. It's more of a newsletter, mm-hmm. and the name of that is. Jersey Boy Eats. Jersey Boy Eats, <laughs> where we've got a kid from Jersey in California looking for all of his favorite things from New Jersey, uh-huh. uh, the versions of it out here, and he, uh, you tell people uh, how shitty it is. It's, or how great it or is. Or sometimes it's great, but I am sort of perpetually disappointed <laughs> right? what California calls a bagel. <laughs> or a slice of pizza. <laughs> right. It's now you're living in Oakland. Oakland, that's right. Is it uh predominantly foods from up there? Yeah, mostly. But now that I'm here in LA, I do plan to go review I think we're gonna do Western Bagel or one of the other famous bagel spots and Bell's bagels. Mm-hmm. Well, you There's a lot of spots in LA that I've been tipped off to go check out. They yeah, they're good. I think what it is about is less that it's not that you can't find good bagels, not that you can't find good pizza. It's just that the the whole like uh, affair of going to get a bagel in California is just so upsetting for so many reasons. What do you mean? It's so usually if it's any good, it'll be super overpriced. Uh-huh. There will be a line out the door. Yeah, you walk in and the place is always going to look like a. Uh, Hollywood movie set. It's just mm-hmm. too nice. You yeah. know what I mean? It's, I it's totally. just too fancy, too uh, much like they're trying to be um, uh, for Instagram influencers yeah. or... Mm-hmm. It's a little too much on it. Yeah. Where in New Jersey, when every town has 200 bagel shops, mm-hmm. it's just about making a kick-ass bagel. Yeah. Growing the, like that, the bagel place down in Long Beach Island... Mm-hmm. Uh, Bageletti's. Bageletti's, a legendary place. Mm-hmm. They have a line. You got to get up early and go. Mm-hmm. But it is definitely not there to impress. Yeah. And the line moves, and it's just a bunch of Jersey mooks <laughs> who know what their orders are, and they're just getting it. And mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like, there's no one. It moves who, quick. It moves quick, and there's nobody on that line that is there to be seen. Mm-hmm. They're there. <laughs> <laughs> there to be fed. Although, you know what's funny? I have become one of those assholes taking pictures of all of my food now. Like, my partner gets so annoyed. I'm like, yeah, because every time I've got like, okay, we need to take a photo of this. We need to document this. And so I have literally become yeah. my own worst enemy. Uh, what is your opinion on the word foodie? Foodie? Well, I don't consider myself a foodie. Mm-hmm. I'm dating a foodie. You're dating a foodie. Yeah, I think a foodie is someone who is always looking for that next new thing, that cool new fresh idea mm-hmm. in food, right? The hip new restaurant right. or recipe or whatever it might be. I'm personally, like, my favorite food is just simple, homemade, no frills, mm-hmm. uh, classic, more old-fashioned. I mean, what I love about the pizza and bagel places where we're from is that you can kind of wander into damn near any place mm-hmm. and get a decent slice or a decent bagel or a d- or like a great meal at a diner. Yeah. Whereas, you know, in L.A., if you want to go to the diner, it'll be like Hollywood's ver- version <laughs> of a diner. It'll be like all 50s themed and the menu is just like everything yeah. costs like 25 bucks. Yeah. And it's just not it's just not the same. You feel like you're playing a part rather than experiencing, you know, the diner is is a working man's 
place. I think yeah. bagels, pizza, these are foods for the working class. They're supposed to be cheap right. and fast and, and easy, and, and yeah. they're not supposed to be fancy. And I think what my newsletter is trying to do is just sort of make fun of how ridiculous, uh, uh-huh. I mean, some of some of these places have gotten. I think California is a place that, you know, w- we both moved here from from the East Coast, right? For reasons. Mm-hmm. It's an amazing place. Right. There's so many things to love about California. Yeah. And the food is one of them. The food out here is excellent. Yeah. Um, but California has this thing where they, they are so aware of how great they are <laughs> that they can't ever seem to stop talking about it. And it's just really fucking annoying. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. It's like someone who knows they're hot. It's like we get it. We get that the weather is perfect. We get that you can go surfing and snowboarding in the same day. Like, come on. Like, yeah, maybe in New Jersey we're all, like, kind of shivering in the cold and next to the freeway. But we got pretty good bagels, and that's something I like to highlight. The diner thing really baffles me Mm -hmm. that there's – and it's not just California. There's, like, there's a large swaths of the country that don't have just – Multiple diners within yeah. a couple towns. And they're always family run. Mm-hmm. You need a lot of Greeks. Mm-hmm. I think that's part of the problem. Mm-hmm. The Greeks aren't in mass in a lot of different places. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, like you just roll in, like the Ridge mm-hmm. in uh, Park Ridge, New Jersey. Place has been there. I was going there when I was a kid and still there. Yeah. And they're kind of cranky and they're not doing anything other than just <laughs> making you food mm-hmm. and there's no airs about it it's consistent though Consi- you just go in you know what you're getting yeah you're getting that omelet that you always get you're getting that burger that you always get and it's just solid mm-hmm. and there's and the menus are a mile long i love those long menus those mi- you know i never order any of the the extra th- yeah like they've always got they've got italian food they'll even have like chinese food on there Pot sometimes roast. Pot, yeah <laughs> with gravy yeah all types of I always just get a grilled cheese with bacon and a yeah. tomato. Um, yeah, ho- entire pages <laughs> that you flip through and never, o- never order from. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the diner is a, such a special place in our culture. I mean, I, I think, know. especially and and yeah, because we are in LA, I think it's worth pointing out. Like, how many scenes from a movie have you watched transpire in a diner? Like, everyone's yeah. always getting. Everyone's always like getting together to have very important conversations. <laughs> Whether they're like yeah. gonna break up with their girlfriend or. You know they're planning a murder about to kill a guy, and they're but they're always hatching it out at the diner. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, Pulp Fiction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's. It is. It, those places are born out of those. That family needed to do something mm-hmm. to make money, and they mm-hmm. cranked it out, and mm-hmm. they had a gregarious matriarch or patriarch in the family, and they just put it up, and they're just cranking it out, and everyone else we're getting jobs, and we're just hauling food. Yeah, here. We're going to make a diner. <laughs> it's going to be great. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, just born out of, you know, food. People making food was just people. It's kind of like, it's very similar to the way that families made food. Mm-hmm. There was a thing about uh, about um, going through someone, uh, uh, I think it was a well-known food writer, Wanted all the old recipes of their of their mother and mm-hmm. grandparents, and they got them, and they thought it was going to be like this treasure trove of ingredients and da da da. Mm-hmm. It was like soup mix and mayonnaise. <laughs> 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 it was yeah. right. It was like super uh, simple. S- yeah, salami and white bread. Mm-hmm. It was just these people weren't trying to impress with their meals. They were just trying to feed their family three mm-hmm. times a day in a time when you never went out to eat. You never ordered in Postmates. Yeah, you just cranked. You had to feed your four kids and the and every day. Mm-hmm. It was not about impressing. It was just about making. Totally. Yeah. Uh, my partner Rex had a really good take actually about the the diner thing or just the food in general. It's like if you want to find good food in yeah. a city, you should get something made by the people who were oppressed in that city like the working class like who built that city who were the uh, immigrants right. that built that city so right in new york it was italians right and it was jews right and it was polish people and you know it was a lot of european immigrants yeah. um in california there we don't have that right but we have there are 
Mexicans. Right. And there's Vietnamese and right. Filipino and Thai and Japanese. So those are the foods that taste better in California that you can have yeah. those. And it's not just about the food that tastes better. It's just that, that authentic, humble right. experience yeah. that I think we're both interested in. That is cool. Yeah. That is very interesting. Um, all right. So the name of that blog again? Jersey Boy Eats. Jersey Boy Eats. And I sent you a thing because mm-hmm. I really think you should do it. Yeah. That Jersey Boy Eats needs an Instagram page Mm -hmm. that just says, we're talking about this bagel, a couple lines, and then drives people to the thing. Yeah. Because I I think it's... I haven't quite figured... for food. I haven't quite figured out how to to do it yet. It's also, like, very much a passion project. Like, I'm not trying to make any money from it. It's it was kind of an outlet to just start writing again. Mm -hmm. It was I've been doing podcasts and and radio for so long now. That I had kind of lost track of um, just being a writer, and and that has been really nice to just that is good to just write once a week and yeah. and actually get some thoughts out. Um, that is really good. It is very noble as a writer. I think that is great. Um, as your uncle, I'm going to monetize it. <laughs> Jersey Boy Eats Instagram page starts driving. Jersey Boy Eats book. Mm-hmm. And and right, I mean, it's an uh, it's a home run. I would love to do a cookbook mm-hmm. one day. I think that'd be really fun. Yeah, but being on tour YouTube is also channel. There you go. I was thinking about starting a TikTok. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really like TikTok. I don't know if you have been. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, uh, there's a you know, I mean, all of uh, bar stool was built out of a uh, guy eating pizza on the street. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, and the other who's the other guy on uh, Instagram who the Italian. He's always eating sandwiches. Cougine. Cougine. He's great. He's great. It's from Staten Island. A couple things. Just the most, uh, reg- the most sister, regular guy. Your sister. <laughs> He's always saying something about your sister. Yeah, and yeah, your yeah. Yeah. Like, all this stuff is built for it. But Jersey Boy Eats is definitely a good one. But the main reason that we had you here, that was kind of a side project, mm-hmm. is your podcast. Um, Explain to our listeners what the podcast uh, is and how it came, why why it became why, why it came across your uh, radar. Yeah, well, um, I had been living in in Brooklyn uh, in 2014, 15, 16, and I had heard about this thing that was happening in Northern California where mm-hmm. people would go out and trim weed. Yeah, and. A couple of folks I knew, because I've always been sort of part of like alternative scenes, like DIY scenes, people who don't really want to work nine to five. So they're always like scrapping around looking for weird jobs. And so a bunch of my friends had gone out and done this weed trimming thing and they came back with a lot of money, like big stacks of cash and all these crazy stories about like hanging out with outlaws on weed farms in Northern California, like being in the middle of the woods. What was a lot of money? What would they come back? They would go just like for the season. Go for like a season and come back with like 30, 40 grand. Wow. Which if you're like in your early 20s yeah. and you're just not, a don't have a college degree, that's a lot of money. It's your whole year. Yeah. And that's what they would do. They would they would get 30 grand and then they would go to Thailand or like Vietnam and, and stretch that for like nine months uh, and then go do it again. Right. And there are a couple other like gigs that people would, you know, some folks would go work as a, a river rafting guide or, or, <laughs> oh, you know, Aspen. Yeah. Work at the ski <laughs> mountain, which is what yeah. I did after uh, my first season trimming weed. <laughs> um, and, but then they would all come back in the fall during the harvest. It was like this harvest time. Uh-huh. Um, except instead of harvesting vegetables, they were harvesting cannabis and, you know, cannabis is a plant that, generally needs to be harvested by hand. They haven't really right. figured out a good way to mechanize it. And they have now somewhat, but it's still um, preferably harvested and, and processed by hand. So right. um, I, I found out about this world and, and it was all, all of this was completely underground. This is pre-legalization, right? Right. There's medical marijuana in California, but this mm-hmm. is way before any of the states have like recreationally legalized pot. So, so these are outlaws in the sense that they're right. like, they're breaking the law, right? And yeah, so that's what you're signing up for. That's what you're signing up for. And so in that world, you know, I started hearing all these like crazy stories, just like hanging out with people who would, you know, who have guns everywhere and knives. And there's like a pack of dogs running rogue <laughs> around the property. And like, you know, at somebody comes up the road, like, and everybody freaks out and gets paranoid because mm-hmm. they think they're about to get robbed. And 
And then people do get robbed. People people do get killed. Um, oh, they're not even looking out for the cops. They're looking out for other people who just know you have a farm and are coming for the weed yeah. and the cash. I think for a really long time they were looking out for they were. I mean, they've always been looking out for the cops. Yeah. And there were times when the cops were more engaged in in prosecuting the pot farmers than other times. You know, mm -hmm. the '80s war on drugs. It was a really scary time to be a pot farmer. You right. had the feds swooping in with helicopters. You know, entire families have been torn apart by by the the war on drugs and camp is what it was called the campaign against um, marijuana. I think is something marijuana production. Marijuana people. Yeah, who knows? That's cr it is crazy when you think of where we're at now. I know mm -hmm. we're jumping, but to think about where we are in a culture with weed now. Oh my gosh! At that at that time, like it's so different now. The fear and the warlike. Yeah, I mean, well, when I was 17, I got arrested for smoking weed in a car. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, I felt like a real criminal. In I mean, Jersey. Yeah, they put us in handcuffs and Jersey. dragged us into the police station, and they t locked me to a bench. And I remember one of the cops was like, you got a little brother, right? Like, I think he had known us from the baseball team because we were a small <laughs> town, right? Yeah. It's like, your little brother, Henry, he must be really disappointed in you right now, huh? Just making me feel like I really fucked up big time i was yeah. just like smoking pot like a teenager but Th that was jersey that was jersey right so this idea that there were people out there living off the grid growing tons of weed smoking tons of weed making tons of cash yeah in their own little world that they had created it was just mystifying to me it's yeah. it was just like a narnia for <laughs> someone like you know an alternative person that, that this could even exist at all. Right. So I had become really fascinated with, with this world. And then in the f summer of 2017 was when I first found out that this kid from my hometown was involved in an insane crime out there in Weed World. Did you know that he was in, that he had been going out and trimming and doing any of this beforehand? No, I think, and that how, was... And how... how how many steps away from your friend group was he? Yeah, so he was uh, one grade below me, maybe one or two grades below me. Okay. So we went to high school together. We were on a couple sports teams together. Right. But we weren't, like, friends. Right. You know? But you knew him. But I knew him. Right. And, uh, so, you know, one of my closest friends, um, their little brother is best friends with Zach, the guy fr in my story. So there are all right. these connections. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so I had no idea what this guy was up to. I wasn't keeping tabs on him, yeah. you know. But one day I had come home and I was just spending some time in my in my hometown and somebody was like, Hey, did you hear this story about Zach? Yeah, like he's a murderer. He killed someone. And I was like, What? Like that guy? No way. And there were all these rumors swirling around. That, right. And the rumors were insane. They were like, Yeah, he like chopped someone's head off with an axe, blah, blah, blah. Oh man. There was all of these and I started looking into it. There were all these crazy social media posts of these articles with his face and then all these insane comments being like this guy like and i just kept thinking like ah something about this feels weird like i just i don't see him as a, a murderer um mm -hmm. but i also was started doing a little research and found out that there were seven people involved in this crime right seven folks were uh at some point arrested for this and so there was clearly, like, a lot more to the story. Right. And then I started talking to Zach's friends. And they are like, oh, yeah, he didn't do it. Um, like, this guy's innocent. Now, at this point, you're – it's kind of interesting because you are – you're not thinking about a story. You're just – there is a journalist in your head mm -hmm. that's just curious. The journalist in my head has always thought, like, it would be great to do a story about Weed World. Uh-huh. And then before this, mm -hmm. oh really? And then when I found out about Zach, I was like, "Wow, this is the perfect opportunity to investigate this place uh. and what goes on here." And you know, there was a couple other sort of contextual elements to it. I was working at WNYC at the time, and I was very on and off at WNYC, as were a lot of producers. Yeah. I wonder if that's still the case or not, but I suspect it is. And so I had been working on this really grueling midterm elections show, mm -hmm. just doing coverage. Of the midterms, the the Brett Kavanaugh hearings were happening at that time. Right. It's kind of just a harsh time in American politics. Yeah. It's only gotten harsher, so it's like hard <laughs> to think about. Yeah. But I remember just doing this daily um, national like political news coverage, yeah. and it just was such a, a grind, you know. 
It was really everything that everybody else is allowed to turn off for a minute. Yeah, you're, you're living. You're allowed. just you're really living it. You know, you yeah. got like Donald Trump's voice in your headphones <laughs> all day and like Non-stop. cutting tape and yeah. So it was a rough gig and <laughs> and then the midterms happened and they were like, all right, see you later, <laughs> um, and they cut me loose. I had no job. Right. And so I was like, well, shit. What am I gonna do? So uh, I was like, I think I'm gonna focus on this story. Mm-hmm. And you know, I think a lot of journalists want to make long form stories. I mean, that's kind of like a big goal for myself and a lot of yeah. people in my community like do these sort of big in-depth projects where you can really kind of immerse yourself in a place and experience it. And so that's that's what I wanted to do. Right. Um, it took a long time to figure out how to do that. Yeah. But um, that was the initial impetus. Got it. So uh, you decide, okay, I'm going to go do this. And the, the thing from the outside watching you because from the time you hear this story, mm-hmm. it's 2017, mm-hmm. to the time that uh, Emerald Triangle drops as a podcast, mm-hmm. it's like a year ago? Yeah, it was November 2022. 2022. Yeah. Uh, so that's a lot. Like I, when I'm always impressed when people grab onto something and like a film idea, like when you hear people say, oh, it took me 10 years to make this movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, it shows that there's really something there and that they're really passionate about it because we all have ideas and then after six months, you're like, ah, I'm moving on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. that kind of a thing. But you were you were like a dog on a bone and you stayed on this for a long, long time and you were going to strange places and you were talking to crazy people and all of that kind of thing. Uh it definitely became something that you were going to see to the end. When you first, what was your first step? Was it getting in touch with Zach or was it coming out to California uh, the to fir- start talking to people? I think the first step was talking to Zach's friends. Back Zach's in, friends. Back home. And, and hearing what they had heard. And hearing what they had heard and just getting the story, that initial story. Uh, they knew a lot more than I did because they had talked to him. Mm-hmm. They had talked to him um, the day before he turned himself in. Uh-huh. So... I got it from them, and then that fall, uh, I had decided to go trim, try to trim some weed myself. I kind of figured, like, the best way to do this story would be to work on a pot farm. Uh And so that was, it was the fall of 2017 that I decided to go out to California, and my dad uh, knew a pot farmer, kind of randomly. It was so weird, because... Me and my girlfriend at the time, we we're like, we're, we want to go like go trim weed, and uh, I guess my parents had like got wind of this plan of ours, <laughs> and it was kind of funny. Instead of being like, oh, that's such a terrible idea, they were like, oh, my dad was like, oh, actually, I know a pot farmer, go just go work for him, <laughs> right? And we're like, oh, all right, <laughs> that sounds convenient. Yeah. So that's what we did. We drove all the way across the country and went up to Trinity County and started working at this weed farm. And how quickly did you realize, like? The Jersey Kid in me, here's Pot Farm, going to trim some weed. I'm picturing uh, Nirvana. Mm -hmm. I'm picturing weed everywhere, probably beautiful hippie girls around. (laughs) Uh, It's just going to be heaven. Yeah. Was it? It was a mix. Uh, Yes and no. I mean, it was beautiful. I mean, it still is beautiful. You were in this very natural place surrounded by the forest. Yeah. There's a big creek on that property we used to swim in. Um, You know, we all, uh, there was like 10 of us living together. And and we all were living in this yurt Uh that was like me, you know, it had like, I think like maybe six beds kind of like up against the wall. So it was like a big sleepover every (laughs) single night. (laughs) Right. And uh, it was fun. You know, it was a lot of fun. We smoked a lot of weed. We went on a lot of hikes, but it was also like really hard work. That's the other aspect of it. Right. What's You're, the work day like? So you wake up in the morning, and uh, because it's a weed farm, it's not the earliest <laughs> shift. You, Ten o'clock start? Yeah, we would like start at like 10 or 11, and then you know the, the farmer would walk in and uh, start cooking a veggie dog and taking a bong rip, and we're like, are we working today? He's like, yeah, we're working. <laughs> and around 12 o'clock, we would like get up. Uh, we'd all pile into this big pickup truck. Uh-huh. And this would have been right around October, September, mm-hmm. I would say. So September, like, y- we have to harvest the plants. They're in the ground. They've been growing all summer. And so we got to go harvest them. Right. So we would drive up this mountain. So his house was at the bottom of this valley. And then on the top of the mountain was this weed farm, all of these gardens. Right. And 
the first time I saw that, it blew my mind. Yeah. I mean, I had never, I'd only seen that in a movie, you know, yeah. big, tall pot plants. And yeah, and it felt like, I was like, wow, this is some real shit that I'm in right now. I mean, it's kind of like funny. Like acres of it? No, it w- they were smaller patches, gardens. Right? Yeah, like patches. Um, but you just see it and it's just like so, like that uh, the pot plant with the five pointed leaf, such an iconic yeah. thing. I don't know. It just makes you feel a certain type of way. Mm-hmm. But we would go up there and we'd have these little scissors and, and we would clip the buds from the plant and we'd st- stack them neatly in a bin and then we'd go from bed to bed and you had to keep all the strains in one bin to keep them all together. Right. And we'd do that all day until it got way too hot. Um, uh-huh. And then around, uh, like, wh- as the sun was starting to go down, we would all go down as fast as we could and, like, jump in the creek while we were still hot. Right. And then... So you're not muddy, dirty... Well, I wasn't because I was there for the harvest. The harvest, I think people, most people will tell you, is like some of the most enjoyable labor involved in, in right. farming weed. It's not the, the hard stuff. So you're getting the big stalks of it, and you've got to take mm-hmm. all of the leaf off of it, get it down to buds. Mm-hmm. So the first thing you do is you dry it. Right. So we would hang them all up to dry in this big shipping container. Right. They got to dry for like two weeks, and then he had a bunch of weed that had already been drying. Right. So that... After that, he after we got it all down, all harvested, uh-huh. then it was time to trim it. Right. And the trimming is, is one of the harder jobs. Right. That's where you're using these tiny little scissors called chikamasas uh-huh. that are made for pruning bonsai trees. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you've got this little bud in your hand, and you go, and you just give it a little haircut. Right. And just make it look nice, you know. So it looks like a like a bud like that you would buy at the dispensary. Right. Because it doesn't come off the plant that way. Well, Sam, I don't want you to, uh, just to even the playing field here, um, I uh, had a house off campus, mm-hmm. and we had a closet that wasn't being used, <laughs> and we grew about eight to ten plants in there. Nice. And we didn't have those fancy scissors that you guys had. <laughs> we pretty much just got drunk and then tried to smoke it prematurely. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, think we still wet. <laughs> I don't think we dried it. We were just impatient. Yeah, we yeah. had no money. That's great. <laughs> and uh, we got some of them that were really great. Mm-hmm. But the the connection to it of growing it and making it, uh, you know, this thing that you were always trying to find underground in New Jersey and yeah. during those times, like it was a uh, it was a very wholesome, very natural. How could this be a legal substance? Yeah, exactly. Right. And I remember like buying weed in New Jersey as a teenager. You would get you like it was shady. You would like go up to like <laughs> this car and you'd get this little baggie and yeah. you jump in, jump in <laughs> next to this guy and he'd give it to you and you'd pay him 20 <laughs> bucks and you'd be like, constantly looking over your shoulder for yeah. the police. And like people did get arrested all the time. Small towns like on the East Coast, it was and, and you would get this little bag and it'd be like less than a gram. They'd always skimp a little bit mm-hmm. off the top. It was terrible quality. Yeah. And we would all smoke it together with all of our friends. But if you didn't throw nasty. $5 on the bag, you weren't allowed to smoke that blunt because <laughs> like, we were broke. <laughs> yeah, of course. So it was just so funny now to come out to California and you just see it in such yeah. quantities. And So, but as you're, what about the leading up to the story of where this podcast takes us? Mm-hmm. Uh, was there as natural and as cool as the farming and the connection to this herb is? Mm-hmm. Uh was there a danger vibe to it? Because at the time it is illegal. Yeah. Um, I mean, you worked for good people. Mm-hmm. Um, but is there a undercurrent of this could be a dangerous place or is it n- not that really? I think uh, it's both. So uh-huh. I, like you said, I was working for good people like who I trusted. Yeah. And I had a nice, dry, warm place to sleep at night. Mm-hmm. And I knew I was going to get paid at the end of the day. That is not the situation for a lot of pot trimmers. You know, a lot of pot trimmers go out to the Emerald Triangle, right. which is Mendocino, Humboldt, Trinity County, and they they they. Sw- this is where during the Green Rush, during the like 2010s. You know, they would just go look for jobs at the grocery store. They would stand at the gas station with a sign mm-hmm. or holding a pair of scissors, just looking for <laughs> trim work. That's how it was. You know, right. it was like the guys you see hanging out at Home Depot, like waiting to get picked up. Right. Right. And. Uh, but they're white hippie kids. But they're white hippie kids, exactly. Right. And and a lot. They're also international kids. A lot of people from Colombia and and France and Germany and uh-huh. like, you know, Argentina. Like a, a lot of just like traveler types. Right. Backpackers. Yeah. And um, 
So for these kids, I mean, they're just going out there not knowing who they're going to work for. And so you can get picked up by damn near anyone. And so talking, when that first time I was trimming, I had all these conversations. I, I was asking all these questions because I was so curious to learn what this place was about. And I just like the range of experiences that I heard about was really mind blowing. Like everything from, oh, like living in a beautiful house with somebody to cook you meals every single day and getting paid mm -hmm. like perfectly on time to like slumming it in like a wet soggy tent mm. and having to like work 12 or 13 hours a day and then at the end of the season you do that for three weeks and then the guy kicks you off the farm and you don't get paid Oof. and then you're like shanghai in northern no. california with no money no car just to close on your back Jeez. you get and, and things can get really desperate really quickly well and that is definitely super scary and and the folks that i talked to had experienced some scary things you know right they had experienced threatening situations with crazy individuals you know there's a lot of drug use that goes on in those places um yeah people on a lot of like meth and yeah. psychedelics and uh and it's also just because it was illegal you yeah. know it attracted folks some of the folks who wanted to become pot farmers were just were just criminals you know mm -hmm. folks who had made made their living off of committing crimes whether those were violent crimes or just, you know, what I would consider victimless crimes of, like, buying and selling drugs. Right. But you just never know who you're going to come across out there. And I had a couple threatening encounters. You know, I was doing an interview at a bar in that town. Uh -huh. That town, I was working in a town called Weaverville. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was this drunk guy at the bar who was, like, chatting us up. And then at a certain point, kind of got sketched out by the fact that I had this tape recorder. This is when you're doing the story. Yeah, I started interviewing some of the folks I had met while okay, I was... Okay, hold on a sec. Just yeah. for context. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, our listeners don't know what, this cr what the crime was. It was murder. And it was the head of the pot farm... Yeah. ...was murdered... By his workers. By his workers. Yeah. One of which is the kid that you... Grew up with. Grew up with. Yeah. So, I'm going to let that linger because it is pretty cool. You feel it, Tucker? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is, so now, this is like, a, this is like, it, it could not get any, of all the underbelly that we're talking about, it could not get any nastier than this. Someone is actually murdered and all of these kids that were there mm -hmm. are now suspects. And a lot of those kids who were suspects were people doing this very same thing that me and my friends were doing that right. summer. Right. So the question was, what the fuck happened on this pot farm? Right. For this to transpire, like something had to go horribly wrong. Yeah. Or many things had to go horribly wrong mm -hmm. because we heard a lot of stories. It's really common for trimmers to get ripped off and sent home without any pay. Shanghai. It's also really common for growers to get robbed. Um, usually not by their workers, but usually by other folks who find out the location of their pot farm right. and come up there with guns and steal their entire harvest. Oof. Or maybe you're doing a deal and you're selling your weed to somebody and you bring 50 pounds of weed, which is you're hoping to get $100,000 for it, and they just point a gun at you and take it all, right? And then <laughs> yeah. you're, that's, your whole, that's your whole income for an entire year. Yeah. So we heard about these stories. Um, all these stories, by the way. Perfect beginning mm -hmm. in a diner. <laughs> yeah and we yeah exactly and i think one of the the things that i wanted to figure out was like how 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 common is i was still trying to figure out how common is this you know to have yeah. the bad experience versus the good one mm. um because like you said i thought it was nirvana going out there yeah but it, you know quickly it became a mixed bag and then I think figuring out what happened at this part farm, because even though there is a lot of crime that occurs, there's not like a lot of mur like murder Murders. is still pretty rare. Yeah. Like, th and this one was particularly bad. I mean, this guy was stabbed in the neck, mm -hmm. stabbed multiple times. Mm -hmm. um, so it was up close, personal, and yeah. pretty vicious. Stabbing is a different level. It's not like shooting a guy and no. walking away. It's there's something else going on there. Yeah. So now you're poking around in this bar asking stories with your tape recorder mm -hmm. and this guy gets nervous and he starts freaking out and he's like, you're doing interviews in Trinity County. And he like chased us out of this bar. And then the guy I was, with was like, I'm going to go get my shotgun from the back of my car. You better get the fuck out of here. Blah, 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 blah. 
and they're just yelling at each other. Oh and and these guys are drunk, you know? Yeah. So I don't think I was ever, like, fully... I didn't think that this guy was going to kill me or anything. Mm -hmm. But it did, like, quickly point out to me, like, oh, yeah, like, I probably should have known better than to, like, take my tape recorder in the bar. Like, I should do this. Right. Now, quick side note on mm -hmm. the on the reporting of it, that kind of thing. Uh, you're... You're a journalist in your heart and mind. You have you're curious. You you're also, uh, um, I don't know how you described it earlier. People that don't like nine to five jobs, a little alternative. You, you're not scared to like travel and go into strange places and go to India and whatever. And uh, I get very nervous when I'm going to a place in, in a different foreign country and it's anything below four stars. I get very nervous. <laughs> If there's not a concierge I can ask, <laughs> I get very skittish. I want to be that guy, but I'm not that guy. Uh, when you're in that position and the guy's yelling at you in the thing, yeah, does it roll off you, or are you, you you didn't pack up and split? No, no. I was with people who I who who I trusted, who were pot farmers and and growers and workers. Yeah, and I was like, okay, I'm rolling with these guys, and as long as they're not freaking out, I'm not freaking out. Uh -huh. Like. And I think that was the big, that was like the big challenge reporting in Northern California was just getting to know people, yeah. getting to know the community a little bit more and understanding how things function and, mm -hmm. and like what's, you know, what you can and cannot get away with socially. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you're, yeah, you're, you have that journalist thing where you, you don't, uh, you know, it's like some people can be nurses. The curiosity trumps the, the fear. The fear of it. Yeah. For sure. And I knew I was getting somewhere too. Uh huh. Because, most of the folks that I talked to had never been interviewed before. Right. And, you know, regrettably, like, I've got dozens of interviews with weed workers and mm -hmm. growers that, you know, didn't ma make it into the podcast. Because um, the podcast narrowed its focus on the... Specifically this, this crime. This crime, right. Right. Um, but most of the, the vast majority of people I talked to, almost every one of them, had never been interviewed before. Mm -hmm. Had never really told these stories to anyone other than their own, own immediate community. Yeah. And there's a sense of, like, normalcy about all of this mm -hmm. that when you're living up there. Um, and I started to feel it after spending a couple months there. I, like, certain things, I just, like, you know, you see some crazy, like, tweaker on the side of the road with a dog and he's hitchhiking. <laughs> and uh, if I was coming straight from Jersey, I'd be like, ooh, that guy's pretty scary. Yeah. But then, like, three <laughs> months goes by, and I'd be like, oh, I might pick him up. You know, like, <laughs> right? it's just... It kind of you normalize things, yeah. and I think a lot of people had normalized the crime. Mm -hmm. A lot of workers had normalized the fact that they that it was common to not get paid. Mm -hmm. And you know, for me, I was like, no, that's actually really insane and fucked up that there's like these pot f workers who don't get paid, and that it's just yeah. taken as taken for granted. You know, um, so I think that was the advantage of coming in as an outsider. Mm -hmm. But it was also, you know, I'll never, I'll never know what it's like to truly be in that. I, I very much was an outsider, and be in what world? In uh, the like a grower or right or someone. You know, I was working at a pot farm. Yeah, but I also like if things really got bad, I could try to get back to Jersey and stay with my parents. You know, I had this mm -hmm. safety net. Right. Um. A lot of these guys didn't. You know. Right. They were really at th uh, some of the folks I met up there were really sort of like this is the end of the line. You know, they're yeah. not uh, cut out for in office job mm -hmm. they don't have the money for a college degree and you know maybe they're suffering from drug abuse or from mental illness or i mean not to say that that's like the majority of the folks out there a lot of people are just normal everyday folks who who want to live off the grid who want to live yeah as homesteaders but but a lot of the, some of the workers you know were really like this was the only thing really available to them so uh, there's a real vulnerability there uh on the side of the growers too there's a vulnerability for them too because like you know, anyone, like I said, anyone could come up, and, and that's what happened to Jeff Settler, the, mm -hmm. you know, the guy who was the, the victim of, of this horrible crime. Right. It is intense. There is that thing of, I remember walking into a friend's in Colorado's house, and he was growing the whole basement, wall to wall, mm -hmm. the large basement, was filled with plants. And I was very nervous to spend the next night there because mm -hmm. it was like, oh, man, this is... You've got to be ultra paranoid. Oh my gosh! About everything and everybody. Yeah, the paranoia out there is yeah. next level. God, and then you mix it with weed, which is paranoid inducing. <laughs> yes, that's got you know, really. Oh my god! I mean, ju just to jump off on, onto a, a general thing is 
the legalization of marijuana. Mm-hmm. I mean, it takes all of these elements out of it. I know. There's none of that. I mean, and then people like us can just go to the store, yeah, and just buy weed, and just buy it, and never have to worry. But the people who grew that weed probably spent most of their lives living in fear, constant, constant. Yeah, it really does break you, and that's what uh, is ref- that's a, that's a term called hill crazy, which is was the working title of the podcast for many yeah. years. Um, hill crazy is like that specific form of paranoia mm-hmm. that you get when you live out there on a weed farm for months on end. Yeah, and you don't aren't seeing a lot of other people, and you don't have a, a lot of access to the outside world. Any noise coming from the bushes could freak you out. Yeah. You hear a truck coming up the road, you're like, who the fuck is that? Right. Let me get my gun. Like people yeah. and it's and it's real too because people do get robbed. Yeah. So I mean I mean, is that would that happen at all now? Probably not. Oh no. It's actually gotten worse in terms of crime really? on in cannabis. Yeah. I mean this is a whole sort of topic of conversation, but um the situation now is Way different from when I was up there in, like, 29. I did most of the bulk of my reporting happened in the summer of 2019. Uh-huh. And that was right on um, after legalization had, had happened. Mm-hmm. So legalization was 2016 in California. Mm-hmm. And it kind of coincides with the downfall of the green rush mm-hmm. where there was, for a time, like, it was a really lucrative thing to be growing pot. Yeah. From, like, 2000 to, like, late 90s to, like, 2000. 14, 15, well, it's legal. 16, right around then, you know, the the trimmers were making 150 to $200 a pound, yep. you know, walking home with 30, 40 grand after a season. But the growers were, were making way more than that, hundreds yeah. of thousands of dollars a year, yeah. all cash, all off the books. These guys were spending money on big vacations to Hawaii, right. balling out on big trucks and houses. This was like a boom time, right? right? And then it all dried up and... Now the price of wheat has dropped to like three hundred dollars a pound. So from what a pound? From over a thousand. To now under three hundred. Under three hundred, yeah. and over a thousand was like that's what you would sell for in California. You know, if yeah. you were shipping it to New York, selling it in New York City, you were making two thousand. Right. So it was lucrative. Yeah. But now uh, the price has completely crashed. There's a glut of weed on the market. Uh-huh. I think a lot of the pot farmers are struggling. A lot of them are going out of business. Mm -hmm. A lot of the same people who really sacrificed a lot to grow weed for years, you know, living in fear of the cops, doing it uh, because they love the plant, because they believe that it's a spiritual thing, that it's medicine, that it it should be available Mm -hmm. for people. A lot of those folks are kind of screwed now. It's really sad to see, you know. I was up there not too long ago hanging out with a friend and new collaborator of mine uh, working on a new investigation. Uh Uh-huh. She's a pot farmer uh, and a journalist as well. And mm-hmm. she's trying to get more into making podcasts because she can't make a living as a weed farmer anymore. Wow. She's been doing it for years. and, and so, so she grows the weed up there mm-hmm. and now has all this product. And it's like really hard to sell. Hard to sell it. Because too many folks wanted to get into it. It's like a gold rush type of thing, yeah. right? Like everyone comes in. All of a sudden there's too much weed. The price right. drops. Um, so legalization, ironically, kind of like killed the... The weed movement. All, a lot, all the growers, a lot, a lot of the, not all of them, but a yeah. lot of the growers were against legalization because they knew this was going to happen. But mm-hmm. and if they, if it would take someone being really savvy, mm-hmm. business wise, to like get legit with it and still run that operation, exactly, it's a very small f- portion of the people that could do that. Right, like to comply with legalization in California, yeah. it is the most bureaucratic red tape sort of operation you've ever seen. Like, yeah. it is the most regulated plant in the United States. Like, it's hands most down. regulated everything in California. News yeah. was just talking about how he can't even get things built because mm-hmm. the old, the, the re- um, regulations of everything. Yeah. yeah. So they had this opportunity, California, to legalize this plant and and really create a small scale, like economies of agriculture that could really like bring alive these small towns that was the cool thing about weed during this time yeah a lot of these teeny tiny rural northern california towns suddenly had money right and they could build schools and they could like actually start new businesses and their new business would pop up to support the weed growers and like restaurants would open and coffee shops and it was really like nice to see the revival of these small rural towns and that didn't come to fruition because the legalization, the way that policy was crafted, it just did not favor small farmers. It really favored big business. 
And they had an opportunity to limit the number of acres that an individual farm could mm-hmm. operate under, but they, they chose not to. Uh, so now, like, the vast majority of the weed comes from, like, massive mega farms in places like Santa Barbara. Right. I don't know if you've driven up uh, no. to, in that area recently, but um, you can smell it from miles away. The scale really? of the cannabis farms in Santa Barbara are, like, is next so level. So they got some venture capital, and exactly. some people got really into mm-hmm. it, and that's, The wow. white-collar people got involved, and investors got involved, and all of these, like, hippie homesteaders who had been, yeah. just, like, blood, sweat, and tears their whole lives kind of just got cut out of it. Jeez. So. Amazing story. So the podcast really uh, dives into the solving of this crime. Yeah, we kind of stick pretty centrally to like that narrative of the yeah. jet set. A lot of this context is like I tried to like, you know, my scripts would be like 40 pages and the editors <laughs> would be like cut cut, cut. like we yeah, not yeah. we just can't do it all. Yeah, because the crime is really solving it and figuring it out is yeah. was this guy abusive? Was he a good guy? Mm-hmm. Um what you know, you had an instinct with this kid like this is not a murderer. This is like what what happened? What went down? Yeah. Uh, Do you have a very clear picture of what? I don't want to blow it for the podcast, but do you have a really clear, what did you think of the owner going in? I mean, okay, so. The grower. The grower, yeah. I think in the beginning, it was very much like, the way it was framed in all the news articles was very much like a bunch of outsiders from New Jersey and other places uh, brutally murdering a local cannabis farmer who was like a very well loved member of the community. Uh-huh. He had a lot of friends, a lot of people knew him, and he was just like brutally stabbed to death by like these folks. A lot of them had like never even trimmed weed before. Right. So it was um, like that was kind of the tone of a lot of the reporting was like, you know, this is like a really horrible tragedy, and this man did not deserve this. And you know, I I still agree with all of that. Mm-hmm. But the the reality of what happened on that weed farm mm-hmm. to cause those individuals to murder this man yeah. is way more complicated than we ever thought it would be. Right. And so I'll just say right off the bat, this is not like a cold case. Um, there was, it wasn't like this crime was completely unsolved right? Uh, when I started working on it, but there was still a, a large degree of, of confusion surrounding who actually killed Jeff and why. Right. And it was really that question of the why that we became most interested in. Yeah. The who, you can like read some articles and figure out pretty yeah. quickly. Um, but the why, like why did they do it? Yeah. Was, was way more interesting to me. Yeah. Because I had known Zach mm-hmm. personally. I didn't think he was a murderer. Right. And I really wanted to figure out what happened. And mm-hmm. so we do, I think we do a pretty good job of, of going through like, what happened on this farm right? and to these individuals and how did they change? And that was something I had always been interested in, you know, how does this experience change you Mm -hmm. from being just a person looking for work Mm -hmm. to truly becoming an outlaw? What does that mean? Yeah. And that, so those are the questions that I was most interested in in investigating. And that's kind of where we head with it. That's very cool. It's great. It really is a good listen. It's a, and Crooked City mm-hmm. um, was a – there was one other version of it before yours. Yeah. this So this podcast came out as season two right. of a show called Crooked City, which is a very uh, amazing podcast. Uh, I totally recommend it. But it's very different. Yeah. Um, the Crooked City season one is about uh, the mob in Youngstown, Ohio. And so it's sort of a look back on, like, a lot of crimes in the past and uh, st- a lot of stories of, like, mafiosos about, right. <laughs> like, how they used to commit crimes back in the day. Yeah. That was made by Mark Smerling, who's the story editor on my show. He's an amazing right. documentarian and storyteller. I um, love the mafia that's out of New York, not in New York. Like, upstate, mm-hmm. Ohio, mm-hmm. St. Louis, like... I love stories about mob that pops up <laughs> in different places because it's so yeah. all, all the all the art that was made out of it was really New York based. Mm-hmm. It is cool to have stuff from those yeah. other places. You're like the mafia in St. Louis. I know, <laughs> and it's a great show. It's like uh, I guess the umbrella idea is sort of like 
it's very place based. Yeah. You know, so they were looking at Youngstown, Ohio, and I was looking at the Emerald Triangle. Right. Um, but the shows like couldn't be more different. You yeah. Know? Like this one is very personal. Mm. It's sort of a personal narrative. Yeah. Well, you're a big part of it, and uh, it's it's much more about just like that emotional sort of process of trying to put myself in the shoes of these individuals. If you did not get into writing and stuff and you were you had a couple degrees of um, less responsibility in your life and you <laughs> weren't uh, chasing a career and trying to write and do stuff and you had just gone back for season three and season four of just being a trimmer, mm -hmm. making 30, 40, and then traveling and going back to the farm, mm -hmm. would you have gone hill crazy? I think it depends on who I was working for. Mm. It always, that's what it depends on. What's your farm like, you know? Right. Are you with people you trust? Do you have a warm place to sleep? Or are you in a nasty-ass trailer covered in mold? Right. You know, rainy season's really tough up there. Yeah. These are the mountains. It gets cold. Mm -hmm. It snows in the winter. So when you're deep in the trim season, that's like November, mm -hmm. and it starts to get real cold up there, do you have electricity? Do you have running water? Really? Yeah. A lot of these farms are totally off-grid. Right. All our electricity came from uh, the stream. Like, you know, this... The pot farmer I worked for was like, he was, you know, he's a very respected person in the weed community uh -huh. and he's successful. Yeah. And so his, he was, a, had a well-run operation that was dr making a, like hydroelectricity from the creek and right. we could hang out and we had like a nice wood stove in the, right. in the, but you know, but it was still so cold that one night I left the water in, in the bong and it cracked overnight, <laughs> you know, right. right on my nightstand. Like that's how cold it got. And so when I started to learn about what Zach and the people that he spent that summer with, what they went through, yeah. it was far worse. Right. Like the conditions at that pop farm mm -hmm. were unimaginably terrible. Right. And people pooping in buckets and stuff. Oh, yeah. Or just like shitting in the woods, you know, not showering. They were showering in the creek. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they were they had a they had a, a spring. So they had fresh water uh -huh. to drink. That was the only amenity they had. Jeez. They were all living in like bombed out trailers or, or tents. Oof. There was, you know, there was no food to eat. Right. Um, you know, one of the big vulnerabilities of being a weed worker is that oftentimes you're not supposed to leave the farm. So, and this is especially true in the outlaw days. You go up there and you basically live on this mountain and the grower wants as little in and out as possible. He sure. doesn't want people following you back. He doesn't want you going out right. to talk to people about Yapping where you are. it up at the bar. Exactly. <laughs> so they are very strict about who goes in and out, you mm -hmm. know, and that's where the hill crazy really starts to hit. Right. Not being able to leave. Oof, if you, and you don't know who your other grow other trimmers are going to be. Mm -hmm. You Right. Maybe you're going with one friend, but you're going to meet a lot of new people. Mm -hmm. And if you don't like them, you're like on a bad episode of Survivor. Yeah. And it really <laughs> became that. Yeah. I mean, it was like this story is kind of like Lord of the Flies. Right. It's like what hap what happens when people get extraordinarily desperate. Right. And, uh, yeah, it wasn't Jeez. good. It was not good. If he had just gone to Costco and bought them some Capri Suns <laughs> and one of those big pretzel barrels, uh -huh. they would have been just cut it off a little bit of the yeah. anger. I think so. I right? think, but then you know, there's like get somebody some bagel bites mm -hmm. and a new toaster oven. Mm -hmm. Ugh. But you know, the grower was unable to do that because he was didn't have any money. Right. And the situation at a lot of these pot farms is these growers spend everything they have getting their plants into the ground, and by you know, so that's like you you sell your weed. The cycle is kind of like follows the calendar where you, s you harvest all your weed and then hopefully by january yeah. a lot of it's been sold right uh -huh. and then you got all this money and you're gonna go on your vacation and you're gonna buy yourself some new clothes but you're also gonna reinvest that into the farm yeah all, it all goes into the pot farm so you, by by and then you're living off of that through the spring and then through the summer mm -hmm. so by the time the fall rolls around you're really running on fumes yeah and in this particular farm jeff was in debt to he didn't own the land he was growing on he was mm -hmm. renting it so he was in debt to the landowner yeah and he owed a lot of people a lot of money and he didn't have any money to provide food for any of these workers right and these workers right a lot of them were uh, had warrants, you know. They were on the run. Mm -hmm. They were outlaws too, and so they can't just like 
go into town and apply for a job at Walmart. Yeah. Because they're criminals. Right. So they're stuck here. Jeez. It kind of is this imagery of the Wild West, Mm -hmm. of like outlaws. And it's like, metaphorically, like getting to California is like the end of outlaw country. Yeah. There's nowhere left to go. Like that lifestyle is Mm -hmm. unsustainable. I thought about that a lot when I was coming out here. It's like that whole mythos, that American mythos of moving west, you know? Yeah. Because, I mean, I would argue that the, like, the settler colonial violence that came, that first wave that Mm -hmm. came to California in the 1850s Mm -hmm. um, during the gold rush isn't actually so different than what was happening with weed. You Mm -hmm. know, you had a lot of folks from outside attracted to this very remote place Mm -hmm. for this natural resource that was highly valuable and profitable. And then they go in there to try to extract that profit. Right. And because of money and greed uh, and th- like they cr- like crime happens a lot. Yeah. Crime became really, really widespread. So it's like when you read about the history of California and you learn about the gold rush, you learn about how many like how many massacres against the indigenous people happened, but also how, how, how these settlers were just shooting up each other too, yeah, killing each other over claims. Right. And it was just a, a violent, violent place. And we really romanticize it in, the, in the movies and in, yeah, but it, it was a tough, violent, difficult lifestyle. And that outlaw lifestyle has never really gone away. Mm-hmm. And it's with cannabis. It's kind of like, it's, it's interesting because yeah. you've got like these hippies who are like all about peace and love and medicine. Yeah. And, but some of them <laughs> are also just like, very much like frontier style yeah. cowboy criminals who uh-huh. aren't afraid to like pull out their gun and shoot you <laughs> if you have something that they want. Yeah. And that's kind of the I remember running into that just naively touring or like when I was backpacking through California mm-hmm. and it was like, Oh, we're all just weed and fun and you quickly realize like this guy who your friend says is the coolest guy is like kind of desperate. Yeah. And kind of broke. And he's stealing from us or, like, getting us involved in buying weed so he can take from it. And, like, no, these are, like, there's – it it comes from desperation. Yeah. You know? And it's kind of cool. Like, when then we'll go back to school in September. Mm -hmm. He's living this way year after year after year every day. Yeah. It's like, these are not people to be messed with. They're in desperate Straits. Totally. And like, you know, I think it's also important to point out like that there, I kind of focus on the worst of the worst yeah. of weed world. Uh-huh. And I, I do have like very complicated feelings about that. You know, mm-hmm. I really wanted to try to like point out that this is not like necessarily the status quo everywhere. Yeah. Uh, this stuff does happen. Like mm-hmm. crime does happen. People are desperate. There's a lot of fucked up shit that goes on in Northern California. But at the same time, there is like a flip side. There are a lot of good people doing good work, like growing like organic pot, like mm-hmm. tr- really high quality weed, living close to the earth and making it happen, trying to make it happen. And so it's, it's really, it's a complicated picture. Yeah. You know? Yeah. There's a lot well, of sides great to Great stories. It. Yeah. Uh, you, your, where you were going, where, where you were trimming, did mm-hmm. he, is he, did he transition? Is he now a legal yeah. pot guy? Yeah, he's legal, fully legal now. Yeah, I think, yeah. Because he's very smart. So, like, mm-hmm. that's like, like we were saying, like, there's a small number of people that could make that flip and make it work for them. Yes. He would be one of those guys. Yeah. No, since he's legal, I feel like I can totally talk about this, but um, he became the pot farmer for Woody Harrelson's new dispensary in Hollywood. Yeah. And, and was, they were always pals. And they were pals. Yeah, Tom, Tom Belenko. Right. And he uh, ended up making it work because of that connection and because he was a smart guy. Yeah. Um, they got this great relationship, and now he's got his straight to – but now he's doing straight commercial products. They're right. they're doing, like, these pre-rolls and, and – Stuff like that, and 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 that's what it's all about now. You got to have yeah. like branding, and you got to have marketing, and you got to have graphic design, and you got to yeah. have social media, like all of these things yeah. that people who got into growing weed off the grid 
specifically to avoid all of that <laughs> shit. <laughs> right. They didn't want to be marketers. Like they didn't want to be branding yeah, their permits. No. And dealing with the Chamber of Commerce. Oh God. <laughs> no. Can you imagine like a bunch of long haired, dreadlocked hippies uh, having to like go yeah. to the Chamber of but Commerce? But what's really cool, especially with Tom, was that he was always really brilliant and but also had the alternative enough of that alternative mm -hmm. bent to him that brought him into that world yeah but he wasn't reckless he wasn't he was a, a great kind person yeah he was a lawyer too so he, yes he was he was able to to he was dealing with weed law way before all the legalization. in the 90s yeah. yeah he was part of the early efforts to legalize weed yeah and uh so that so that's a very unusual so yeah, you have to be really well equipped to make that to yeah. make that pivot. Yeah. And so a lot of the folks who are maybe a little bit younger or more tech savvy can really understand how like to market themselves online right. or or just how <laughs> yeah, like you, you got and, and then and then it kind of brings it just kind of brings capitalism into it, you know, it just becomes yeah. big business. Yeah. It kind of is it's not very dissimilar from comedians. Yeah. Like all of a sudden, like there were co comics that were just good at telling jokes and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden the world opened up and it was like can you podcast? What's your brand? Do you, mm -hmm. <laughs> what's your uh, social media marketing? What's all this stuff? And a lot of comics are like, I just wanted to tell jokes because I was funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They didn't get into it because they were good at yeah. bureaucracy, you know? Yeah. So that's why I really like, I don't know. I think with some of the stories I want to work on next, like work on telling that, that, that policy angle a little bit more, you mm -hmm. know, I think what people, I think a lot of people are aware now that the pot farmers are struggling but I think that those nitty gritty details of what is in the policy to make it so yeah. unbalanced mm -hmm. is something that we need to be talking about more. A hundred percent. I mean, cause you can see it happening other places, like even in New York, like they, mm -hmm. you can just tell, I don't know what the details are, but you can tell they're tripping over themselves of like how to make these dispensaries right. And they're yeah. just bumbling the whole thing. It's like they yeah. haven't figured it out. And so like, there's all of these um, illegal guys setting up within yeah, the illegal, illegal system uh -huh. and then there's, that means there's sketchy stuff that kids are buying mm -hmm. in, off the these weird bodega kind of like places it's like yeah like they, the vape cartridges that are made with like horrible chemicals yeah that are like in a really like they like don't have view. an idea of how to they don't get the legislation right because no one's really thinking about it mm -hmm. other than let's make it legal and then the people who try to go legal end up getting screwed because the overhead to be in compliance with pot and just in California, I'm not sure about in New Jersey or New York, but mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. It's like 30 grand or more to get into compliance. You got to do, you got to do like in infrastructure. Game. You got to build like yeah. fences and put in security right. cameras. Everyone's got to be on a payroll. Yeah. And there's a lot of overhead. So all of those people, they just run out of money and they just can't do yeah. it. No. Meanwhile, the guys who are like, fuck that, I'm staying on the black market, yeah. are the only ones who are able to keep doing it. <laughs> right. And, and so in that sense, legalization has been a major failure. Can you still buy weed illegally? And Like, do people still have their drug dealer? Tucker, I'm talking to you, you pothead. <laughs> Hey, I don't smoke. <laughs> that's, that's, all, that's all Joey's thing. <laughs> he does all of it for the apartment. <laughs> yeah, like, can't, like, do people still buy Yeah, it? no, they do, for cheap? sure, for Cause, sure. Because, I mean, my dispensary is not cheap. No, it's just, we're paying 30% in taxes, I think. Right. That's so, right. yeah, it's still way cheaper to get it from your dealer. I haven't right. paid for weed in years because I just get it. People just give it now to it's me just now. everywhere. I, I don't. Have I have so much weed. It's just flying in through the windows. I don't even smoke it. Yeah. I literally smoke maybe like uh, so infrequently. Yeah. And I just <laughs> it just keeps showing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of people who uh, live in California have their still have their guy you know, right. Or they, they got medical, which uh, you can avoid, you know, some, some of the taxes, some of the taxes. Right. Right. But in, uh, you know, on the East coast or places where it's not legal, they're still smoking weed. So yeah. that's got to go somewhere. So for the, uh, so if you're a pot farmer, you're going to make a lot more money selling a pound of weed to Ohio than right. you are to a dispensary in LA. Right. Right. So right. that's where, legalization has failed because they've created this incentive to for the growers to remain on the black market because oh. the only way they can survive economically right so i think in order for and that's not to say i'm against legalization i'm very much for it but i think it needs to happen at the federal level because yeah as long as there is a black market somewhere mm -hmm. then the crime is going to continue the exploitation is going to continue mm -hmm. we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier but i could like talk a lot more about 
the the crime that's happening right now in Northern California is it's kind of gotten worse. And what do you mean? What kind? Well, a lot of the pot farms have just gone full underground and are getting bigger. And the uh, there's a lot of the workforce is immigrant labor now. Like a lot of like Lat- right. Latin American immigrants, like a lot of folks who are just refugees, like on their way north trying to like form a better life, mm-hmm. end up working at these pot farms and just getting killed, getting you know. Uh, well, there's been a there was a really good investigation by the L.A. Times came out last year mm-hmm. about the failures of legal cannabis that I totally recommend looking up but um you know they t- detail some of these stories and they're just like these like poor latino immigrants who are dying because they're like running a, a space heater like a gas heater in their like tent and they like get carbon monoxide poisoning and stuff like that like why is that why is why are those pot farmers like what why is that there's no regulation on the pot farm as part of the legalization yeah. so so many growers have come in Mm -hmm. that it's become impossible to enforce legalization Uh, and so there's no like inspector that rolls up to your farm and yeah i mean there's supposed to be state there's supposed to be but they can't possibly do it you know the mendocino Uh county sheriff's department it's like 20 guys right or less you know right in terms of like deputies on patrol at any given time it's literally like less than a dozen Uh. and they're patrolling this area that's like hundreds of of square miles so th- they physically can't get to all the places. And as a result of this green rush, all of these different types of people started coming in. You know, back in the 60s, it was mostly like people who wanted to grow weed because they were ideologically aligned with this plant mm-hmm. and living off the grid and yeah. creating this medicine, this local farms. But you also had a lot of folks who don't give a shit about any of that. They just want to make money. Right. And these guys come in and they grow huge pot farms. A lot of times they squat on other people's land. A lot of times they squat on public lands, mm-hmm. national parks. They're tapping water illegally from the streams. They're introducing a lot of chemicals, fertilizers to the soil. They're leaving these derelict grow sites with tons of trash and plastic and broken wow. down vehicles. And then the people that they get to work on those farms are the most desperate right. individuals. Because like we talked about earlier, like that, that's the kind of folks who end up at these farms, you right. know, the most vulnerable people. Yeah. So the situation now is honestly a lot worse than it was when I was up there. Wow. But are there as many? Because if if you're saying that it's hard to get rid of the product. Well, they're... Or they're shipping it to Ohio. In those there's places. many, 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 many pot farms now, and they're starting to go out of business uh-huh. um, because there's too many, right? right? So in the green during the green rush, so many pot farmers came in that that's why there's such a glut on the market. Yeah. But to be able to make any money, you have to be growing at a really high scale. Right. Or you need to have a really niche, high-quality product. Right. So you're either going that legal route where you're like, we're doing like beautiful, organic, sun-grown, biodynamic, yeah. highly branded cannabis. Right. And you and you got to connect in Hollywood. Or you're going like full gorilla grow in the national forest Uh where you're just spending as little money as possible. Literally your workers are eating nothing but rice and beans for months and working for dollars a day. And then, and if they complain, they can often, they often turn up missing. That's the other problem. A lot of these folks, like they don't got any support systems in the U S no, especially if they're immigrants. Right. Right. Or like they don't have to be immigrants. They can just be travelers or itinerant folks or like people with warrants, you know, like no one knows, no one's keeping tabs. So if they disappear, and the, gr- the, the people Grower. who are taking advantage of them know that. Right. They're so, not paying for uh, their life, their health insurance. <laughs> yeah. It's a rough scene. And, yeah. and so it's like we got to figure out a way to do legal cannabis that works for these growers yeah. and these workers. It seems like it should be its own department. Like it shouldn't yeah. be up to the Mendocino deputies to go make sure everyone's complying. Mm-hmm. There should be a probably at a state level an inspector – you know, a group that goes and checks in on all of these places. Yeah, well, th- I think they need to just simplify the laws a little bit. They need yeah. to simplify the process of becoming a legal pot farmer. Yeah. Because if it wasn't so hard, you wouldn't have all these guys going the outlaw route. Right. And then if you didn't have black markets all across the South and the Midwest and mm-hmm. the West, like all these states yeah. where it's still totally illegal, then then these black market pot farms wouldn't have a, a place to sell their weed. So they would... They would have to come into compliance right. to sell to the dispensaries. So it really comes down to federal legalization, I think. Yeah. Which feels like it's, it's possible now. It, yeah, definitely more. It's, uh, you know, as, as soon as these other states realize it, they can make a lot of money at it. 
Yeah. I mean, Colorado, I think, did it a lot better than California. And yeah. They, they're says. pulling in huge amounts of revenue. From yeah. It. As a state, like big surpluses. I know. So. Well, now I, I don't know if I want to. I want to go to a diner. I, I guess at the end of this podcast, people are going to want to get high and go to a diner. <laughs> <laughs> I think the thing to take away from it, though, and what I wanted people to know from listening to this podcast is that whenever you smoke weed, that bud has been passed through human hands. Yeah. And there's been some person mm -hmm. who has put a lot of time and effort into growing it mm -hmm. and shepherding it through that process. And hiding it from the cops right. and like keeping it secret from the thieves yep. and working. And those workers with the scissors have yeah. trimmed that weed. And now, even though it ends up in a, in a shiny, nice bag that yeah. you, it feels very nebulous. It's like, there's a lot of human energy that goes into that. Right, so it's just like, right. kind of, we should just appreciate it a little more. I feel like I should smoke everything I've got in my place now. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> and stop acting like it's just <laughs> this extra stuff that my kids are probably stealing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sam, this is great. And I'm so glad, you know, you're here um, because you're doing great work. Thank you, Tom. Uh, the second part is that uh, your family. But really, you Appreciate are doing that. amazing work. And it's at a time when it's very um, uh, difficult to have really talented people stick it out in – uncover great stories and and do this kind of stuff you're doing it and uh i know it's not easy um but you're so talented at doing it you're gonna be a big success and you'll come back and, oh. uh, and talk about the next thing i appreciate that and i have to say you were very supportive of my early reporting process i remember on my first trip up to mendocino i was in my Jeep with a loaf of your bread. <laughs> eating, that's what I was eating on the way. That's right. And then remember when my car caught on fire and yes. I called you and I was like, Tom, <laughs> I need a place to stay. <laughs> that's right. Your whole car caught on fire. Yeah. Yeah. And you lived with me for like a month or so. Yeah, like a month. I don't I don't remember that you being there for a month. I was there, yeah. I hanging know. out in the pool. Yeah. <laughs> it was nice. It is nice. <laughs> um, but yeah, but you're low, you're uh you're a big presence, but you're also uh, fun to be with. So I didn't rec I didn't realize it was a month. Appreciate that. Yeah. Well, enjoy this um, jalapeno cheddar loaf. Oh, we will. And uh, you're going to be heading back east on, yeah. on, a, on a road trip. So that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be cool if you caught up to your grandparents? Your grandparents. I know. They just left. They just left. And they're driving across. Yeah, we're going to have to go real fast to catch up with them. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, your grandfather's going to put the pedal once he gets to St. Louis. He's going to just cruise. <laughs> All right, thanks for doing this. Yeah, thanks for having me on. We got it, Tucker. There you have it, kids. The great Sam Anderson. Make sure you listen to the podcast. So good. And I can't wait for his next one. He's got great ideas, and he's going to continue writing. And it's nice when you have young, hungry people going out there and telling these stories so great it's great to watch it develop and it's just damn entertaining so go check out that podcast thank you for going to tompapa.com the book the tour dates it's all there hope you're enjoying your summer thank you for listening we'll see you next time